Well, good evening and uh, welcome to BDS 101, a, collab a collaborative program hosted by JCRC, AJC, and Jewish Federation of St. Louis. I'm Bob Newmark, and I am pleased to welcome you here this evening. I'm an attorney, and I just recently stepped down as the managing partner of Brian Cave Leighton Paisner here in St. Louis. I've been involved in the Jewish community for 25 years and currently serve on the board of the Jewish Federation of St. Louis, the National Executive Council of American Jewish Committee, and on the advisory board of the Michael and Barbara Newmark Institute for Human Relations at the Jewish Community Relations Council. But enough about me, you joined us here for another purpose tonight. As the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, or BDS, continues to gain public attention, and with the most recent controversial actions by Ben and Jerry's, stating that the company will stop selling its ice cream in the West Bank, we felt it important to begin a more in-depth exploration of what BDS is and why we, as Jewish communal institutions, support measures to publicly condemn this movement as a destructive force to delegitimize the state of Israel. The purpose of tonight's program is to present the fundamentals of the BDS movement, including its origins, current trends, and strategies, as well as the landscape of anti-BDS laws today. We are very fortunate to be joined this evening by two guests. Polina Carey, Senior Manager of National Strategy for the Israel Action Network, and David Winton, Founder and CEO of the Winton Policy Group, who represents our Jewish community in Jefferson City. Our evening will include a 25-minute presentation from Paulina, who will briefly explain the basics of the BDS movement followed by David Winton, who will focus specifically on the anti-BDS legislation that was passed in Missouri last year. Following both presentations, we will begin a Q&A portion and give our speakers some of the questions that were submitted through the registration process that may not have been addressed during their presentations. And if time permits, we will give the speakers the questions that you submit live during the presentation. We invite you to send your questions using the Q&A function and we will end the program promptly at six o'clock this evening. We recognize that we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. And we see this as the beginning of a conversation in our community. We hope that additional programs will be held in the near future. Thank you again for joining us. And I would now like to turn the program over to Paulina. Thank you, Bob, and thank you all for having me here to speak about delegitimization in BDS. Um, I have a PowerPoint, um, thank you, uh, that I'm going to be going through just to uh, describe BDS and delegitimization and how the Israel Action Network works to combat it, um, just to describe what the Israel Action Network is, or IAN as we call it. Um, IAN is a strategic initiative of the Jewish Federations of North America and the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. Um, and we work to combat Israel, uh, the delegitimization of Israel and advocate for peaceful future in the region, which means two states for two peoples. Um, before I begin, I want to make clear that the goal of this presentation is to provide you all with the information you need to understand what BDS is and how it might look in your community, to empower you to feel confident about being a part of the conversation around BDS as you're developing your own thoughts and opinions about these issues. Um, I also know that this presentation covers a lot of material, and it's really meant just to be an introduction to these topics, and I'm more than happy to act as a continuing resource um, holding these conversations. Uh, during this presentation, I'm going to discuss the threat that the delegitimization movement is posing um, and the opportunities that we have to effectively combat it. I'll also try to answer the question of why well-intentioned people sympathize and even sometimes support BDS and what we can do to engage them in conversation and maybe change their perspectives. Uh, next slide, please. So before we can get into BDS, the first thing we should be asking ourselves is, what is delegitimization besides a seven syllable word? <laughs> we define delegitimization as a global campaign that seeks to demonize and isolate Israel from the international community in order to undermine its sovereignty as a democratic Jewish state, um, which would also mean uh, uh, undermining uh, the possibility of a two-state solution. Uh, while creating the conditions for a world without a Jewish state. Um, BDS, which we'll get into um, in a bit, is a subset or a type of delegitimization, but delegitimization can be a lot of things and is not limited to just BDS. Uh, next slide, please. 
So how does delegitimization actually manifest itself in the world? How do we see it generally? Uh, the most popular way is obviously through the boycott, divestments, and sanctions movement, otherwise known as the BDS movement, uh, specifically passing resolutions that call for BDS um, in governmental bodies, churches, academic associations, student governments, many places. Uh, within socially responsible investing in the corporate area. Um, we'll get to Ben and Jerry's a little bit later. <laughs> um, and over the last few years, we've also just seen a general uptick in Israeli businesses and products being screened out of investment um, spaces. Uh, the disruption of pro-Israel events. Uh, we've seen many times that when you have an Israeli, sometimes an Israeli government official, sometimes just an, a general Israeli public figure, um, come to speak on um, college campuses specifically, but also just generally within the community. Um, they're shouted down or protested at before they get a chance to even engage with the crowds. Um, this is a very popular tactic right now, and we don't anticipate that changing anytime soon. Um, the organization of anti-Israel marketing campaigns. Um, when we say marketing campaigns, we're referring both to old school marketing materials, uh, like billboards and bus stop ads that call for BBS. Um, but of course, marketing has greatly evolved since then to include digital targeted ads, memes, videos, um, all across online networking platforms. Um, as a result, BDS messaging has been able to reach far more folks than it has through traditional uh, highway billboards, for example. Um, and then lastly, another way that we see it is with um, UN resolutions. So this could look like a general anti-Israel resolution passed through the general um, UN General Assembly, um, or it could refer to the work of the Human Rights Council, um, which recently, a few years ago, created a blacklist of companies that do business over the Green Line in Israel. Uh, and we also see this with um, anti-Israel advocates using UN platforms like UNESCO um, to ignore or minimize Jewish historical roots to certain areas in Israel, like the Temple Mount. Uh, next slide, please. So let's get into BDS, um, our main topic for the day. Uh, I'm clearly talking about BDS with the implication that it is a negative campaign and that it's been destructive um, to peace efforts between Israelis and Palestinians, um, which we'll get into a little bit more later. Um, but the truth is that all of the tools that make up BDS, the boycotts, divestments, and sanctions have historically served as tools for good in the world. So we just wanna clarify before we go further that our mission is not to end the use of any of these tools specifically, um, because they can be effective and helpful in other areas. Um, so that being said, where did BDS come from? Uh, the modern day BDS movement began in September 2001 during the UN World Con uh, Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa. During this conference, Zionism was equated with racism and um, Israel was called an apartheid state that was committing genocide. Uh, originally, the conference's goal was to seek out partners in combating racial discrimination across all aspects of society. Uh, what ended up happening was American Jewish organizations and Israeli organizations were intentionally excluded from the conference and not eligible to participate. Eventually, what ended up happening is that the U.S. and Israel withdrew their delegations midway through the conference, and anti-Israel advocates were able to take over and make this stunning uh, resolution that really moved the ball forward um, of BDS. Uh, to piggyback off of that, um, in July of 2005, a coalition of over 170 Palestinian organizations called for a BDS agenda against Israel. Many groups now credit this call from Palestinian civil society as the inception of the movement, although U.S. groups have pushed for it for years prior following the German conference. Um, this call to civil society is where we first saw the BDS list of demands um, opposing Israel, which really solidified the movement as we know it today. Uh, they issued a call for boycotts, divestments, and sanctions on Israel as a form of nonviolent protest to get Israel to comply with their three main demands, which are ending the occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the security wall, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality, and respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. Uh, when they refer to occupation here, they're referring to the pre-1967 um, lines, and we don't have enough time to really go into the nitty gritty of all of this, but um, I'm happy to discuss this more offline after your presentation. Uh, slide, thank you. So let's start 
when we're talking about BDS, let's start with what most progressive, progressively aligned Americans believe when it comes to Israel and BDS, because these are the people with, we at IAN call the movable middle, which means that they're not fervently anti or pro-Israel. They generally don't know a lot about the conflict. They might've heard of BDS once, but they're not really sure what it means. So first and foremost, many Americans believe that Israel is strong. Um, for Gen Zers and younger millennials, um, we might not realize that like many of our parents, grandparents, and great grandparents um, remember a time when Israel did not yet exist um, and knew a world without Israel. Uh, these older generations remember the Holocaust, um, either they lived through it directly or their parents did. Uh, meanwhile, baby boomers remember the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, and they recall times when it seemed like Israel was on the brink of destruction. Meanwhile, Older millennials recall the Camp David Accords and have seen Israel during a time of peace and relative calm with hope for the future, while younger millennials and Gen Zers who came of age post 9-11 have mostly seen Israel during times of war with a very strong military. Um, this has clearly created a generational divide um, within and with, um, outside the Jewish community and how some of us view Israel, um, with some still viewing Israel as David and some now viewing Israel as more of a Goliath in the old parable. Uh, second, most Americans do note and hold um, the US-Israel relationship is very important for foreign policy um, and understand that the country is in a special relationship, whether it's because of the shared Jewish connection, the similarities between the two countries as Western, westernized nations, or for other reasons. Um, related, to that last point, uh, the U.S. Americans within the United Americans hold Israel to a higher standard than it does other countries. Uh, this is primarily for two reasons. Um, firstly, because we have such a close relationship with them, uh, Americans uh, hold them to the standard that we would want to uh, have for ourselves, um, and the idea that Israel claims to be like us as a Westernized nation with similar ideologies to those in progressive American movements. And so um, there, this creates a higher standard that they believe Israel should live up to. Um, I know uh, former uh, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is now former uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, but uh, if you ask most Americans to name one Israeli politician, if they're able to name one at all, it is Netanyahu. So his impact on what Americans think about Israel really can't be understated, um, uh, especially over the last four years of the Trump presidency. There was a very close relationship between former President Trump and now former President, uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu. Um, for better or worse, the countries had a very strong working relationship during this time, uh, knowing how polarized our country is and has been. Um, for the past few years, uh, there was this idea that if you didn't support President Trump, um, the fact that Trump and Netanyahu had such a close relationship bred some mistrust of former Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, and it's yet to be determined how this mindset will change or evolve now that we have a new Prime Minister and a new government taking office. Um, the last, uh, the second to last related are related points. Um, most Americans do generally believe that Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state. Um, at the same time, they see BDS as a strategy to improve human rights. Uh, BDS campaigns, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, do a very good job of uh, tapping into that emotional narrative um, that are very powerful and play to the hearts of people who don't know that much about the situation on the ground or know very little about the issues, um, but have a general sense of they want to do good in the region. Um, it's tough to look at an ad featuring um, a picture of a Palestinian uh, child um, and not feel something, this tactic has proven very effective for the movement and only continues to be more successful as it takes over, especially on social media. Uh, lastly, and very importantly, most Americans know nothing about BDS outside of maybe a general sense that there supports human rights. Uh, if you see the picture on the slide at the bottom, um, that is the Parthenon in Greece. And I'm showing you that because a few years ago, our colleagues at the Israel on Campus Coalition held several meetings with students who are on campuses with very high rates of BDS. 
And they asked the students about BDS and how it was affecting them. And they started talking about the Parthenon because they thought it was in Israel and was being affected by the boycotts. Um, I bring up this story because sometimes uh, when we're having these difficult and also and often emotional conversations around Israel and BDS, it can be helpful to take a step back and remember that most of the people we're engaging with really don't know what we're talking about. There are certain terms that really aren't necessarily known in the general American audience. And so we have a better chance of success and having an actual dialogue when we're all on the same page. Uh, I want you uh, all to remember these points as we discuss how BDS has remained influential and why Americans may consider supporting it. So on to that last point, what does BDS at um, ad, what do BDS advocates advertise their movement as? Um, in their own words, BDS is a Palestinian-led movement for freedom, justice, and equality. And BDS is an inclusive, anti-racist human rights movement that is opposed on principle to all forms of discrimination, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So take that at face value. For example, I'm a college student. I just registered as a Democrat so I can vote in the upcoming elections. I'm looking to get involved in social justice causes and do something good for the world. I want to protect and support all vulnerable populations and ensure full equality for all types and stripes of people. BDS supporters are telling me they're against racism, every form of discrimination and are really working uh, for human rights. That sounds great. I can get on board with that and why wouldn't I? Next slide, please. So BDS activists really have capitalized on this messaging and have been very successful in framing uh, the issue of BDS around terms of morality. They couch their goals in human rights language using terms like freedom, justice, equality to promote their mission. The idea here is that if you want those ideals too, if you want to live up to those standards, then you also should join in the movement. So the strategy of BDS activists is to be progressive and passionate about human rights. There, um, and a lot of this, uh, language mirrors what other uh, groups in the United States and elsewhere um, use in social justice, justice initiatives. And so it sounds like something that many progressive Americans want to get on board with because they're already supporting uh, criminal justice reform here in America or rights for LGBTQ communities here. So next slide, please. Unfortunately, um, here are some quotes from actual BDS leaders. Um, as you can see, these quotes don't exactly reflect the nonviolent pro-peace um, and inclusive uh, views that they were talking about in the general mission statement of BDS. In fact, it appears the leaders of BDS are discriminatory against Israel and specifically Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, many leaders of BDS do not really support Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state in any part of, of, of the Israeli borders. Um, in addition, BDS embraces Palestinian uh, rights to self-determination, but they deny the Jewish people the same right, um, which is a really unbalanced and clearly prejudiced way of thinking. Uh, the bottom line is, and we'll go into this in more detail, is that BDS leaders and organizations that strongly support the movement maintain the position that it is not anti-Semitic or discriminatory in any way, but in words and actions, this is not always the case. In fact, in many, many times, the actions and language of hardline BDS supporters is less about being pro-Palestinian and more about demonizing and punishing Israel and the Jewish people in general. Next slide, please. So now that we know generally what BDS uh, advertises itself as, but what um, a lot of its leaders say it really stands for, um, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into the actual tactics. One way and perhaps the most commonly known way that uh, BDS uh, focuses on Israel's through economic boycotts. Um, in other words, organizing uh, boycotts of Israeli products. So in the first image is one product, we should all recognize Sabra, which is a very popular hummus brand and has been targeted by many BDS campaigns worldwide, um, especially those on college campuses. Uh, one thing that isn't really well known about the brand is that it's co-owned by Pepsi, which is an American company. It's headquartered in New York and its products are made in Virginia. Uh, so the important thing to know about these types of campaigns is that it imp its impact 
lies mostly on influencing people's hearts and mind around the conflict rather than actual economic, um, economic outcomes of, boy, of the boycott. It's not really about the hummus, uh, which is again, very loosely tied to Israel, as much as it is about promoting anti-Israel language and really normalizing that language. Um, the next image is a flyer for a divestment campaign. Uh, what do divestment campaigns look like? Uh, we also we often see them on college campuses, uh, within in, uh, church bodies, academic associations, and what these campaigns do is call on the universities, governmental bodies, faith centers, all of those, to divest their investment portfolios or investment funds from Israeli companies or those that do business with or in Israel. Uh, so even though BDS can have a major economic impact on Israel, uh, it can still Ultimately, it is harmful um, in a psychological capacity because it really sours the conversation about Israel and um, what it means to be uh, supportive of Israel. So let's look at some recent examples of BDS and how it plays out. Um, first, I think we've all heard about Ben & Jerry's. Um, in July, the ice cream company announced that it would no longer sell its products in the occupied Palestinian territories, nor renew its licensing agreement with its local Israeli manufacturer. Um, the company did not define um, the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, what's interesting is many within the BDS movement, although supportive of this move, also, cri also criticized the company for not going further and ending its presence in the state of Israel completely. This is a prime example of shifting goalposts. And that some, and really illustrates that some within the uh, BDS movement are much more concerned with penalizing all of Israel um, than addressing Palestinian welfare. Um, relatedly, in May, uh, more than 400 alumni campus, uh, alumni campus groups, faculty, staff, and students signed an open letter, not only denouncing Israeli policies, but also pledging non-cooperation with NYU, uh, the New York University, uh, study away campus in Tel Aviv. Uh, this is most simply an academic board plot. And, um, it really others uh, Israel as a uh, educational opportunity abroad and also uh, demonizes students who are looking to study there for various reasons, um, including just history, uh, Jewish culture, all of these things. Um, and then likewise in May, uh, during the escalation of the conflict, there were calls from some congressional representatives um, to end US aid for using the polar, um, US aid for Israel um, using the polarizing argument that these funds are used to demolish Palestinian homes. Next slide, please. Relatedly, and especially with the recent um, escalation of violence between Israel and Hamas, um, we've also seen a rise in the normalization of anti-Zionism. So what is that? Um, the idea here is basically BDS activists will say, if you identify as a Zionist, we're not going to talk to you, we're not going to collaborate with you in any way or support you. We're not going to normalize the idea of Zionism as an acceptable ideology. It's out of our tent. Um, these are examples of anti-normalization of Zionism in action. Um, as you can see, there is no nuance allowed for what Zionism is or the variety of ways Jewish people may, may identify as Zionist, right? It's not a one size fits all. Uh, anyone who labels themselves as Zionist or supportive of Israel in these situations are labeled by that association as someone who's like a Nazi or supports terrorism. Um, and the, the two posters on the slide are examples that emerged in protests during the recent escalation between Israel and Hamas. So what are some reasons to oppose BDS? Um, and why spend any time at all fighting BDS? How successful has it really been? The answer to that question depends on how you define this success. To date, PDS has not had a severe economic in impact, um, putting the coronavirus aside, uh, Israel's economy has been thriving, um, and it's been able to re uh, reopen negotiations and conversations with several company, uh, countries that it previously wasn't able to, including the UAE and Bahrain. Um, so it definitely hasn't been isolated in that way on an international scale. Um, mean, and additionally, BDS hasn't caused any large scale sweeping changes across the political scene ever uh, either. But if we're thinking about the intellectual and psychological impacts of BDS, 
Um, it definitely has managed to alter public opinion on Israel, and it does have real cultural and psychological impacts in the areas that it touches. Um, and so here are the general reasons why we think as a society, it is no good to endorse BDS. And if you're ever confronted with the question of why not, um, these are some of the reasons that we personally do. First, the movement promotes an extremely simplistic view of the very complicated Israeli-Palestinian conflict, presenting one side as fully good and the other as evil. Um, BDS, uh, secondly, BDS supporters claim that their movement is nonviolent. However, its co-founder, Omar Barghouti, embraces armed struggle as a legitimate right, and members of terrorist groups like Hamas are affiliated with BDS um, and the BDS National Committee. And um, lastly, this is my personal reason, um, BDS is a divisive tool that drives Israelis and Palestinians, as well as factions of the American community, apart rather than together, damaging the cause for peace and justice, which BDS's mission argues is what it's trying to accomplish. Building and sustaining a lasting peace requires an environment of cooperation and collaboration amongst Israelis and Palestinians on the ground. And if we support two states for two people as the only equitable and practical solution to the conflict, EDS is not the route to bring that about. Lastly, I just wanna briefly discuss anti-BDS legislation. As I know, um, our next presenter will be going into detail of Missouri's anti-BDS law. Um, as of 2001, 33 states have passed bills or executive orders designed to um, discourage boycotts of Israel with companies that seek government business and or investment. The vast majority have passed with broad bipartisan support. Um, these laws um, and executive orders do not directly or indirectly regulate speech or actions of individuals. Rather, they attach conditions to how government spends tax dollars or invents, invests pensions that it stewards. Um, most anti-BDS laws have taken one, or one of two forms, contract focus laws requiring government contractors to promise that they are not boycotting Israel during the time they are contracted with the state government, and investment or pension focus laws, which mandate public inf um, investment funds um, avoid entities boycotting Israel. So I know that was a whole lot of information, and I just want to say thank you so much for having me speak. Um, I'm happy to act as a continuing resource um, with regards to discussing Israel, BDS, and um, anti-Semitism. And I know uh, we'll be sending out a follow-up email um, and I'm happy to uh, send my contact information along with that to follow up on some questions. Thank you, uh, Paulina, so much for that, uh, that overview. I know there's so much here. Um, that uh, needs to be unpacked. And uh, we didn't give you a ton of time to do it, but that was uh, really fantastic. Uh, I'd now like to uh, turn the program over to David Winton, who will uh, spend a few minutes giving us a brief overview of uh, the Missouri legislation that was adopted last year, uh, what it says and what it does not say. Uh, David? Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Pauline. Uh, I will be brief because I'm not sure there's a ton to add. But uh, I do want to speak specifically to Missouri's legislation that we passed in 2020. And I think um, we did a lot of learning from a number of different states that had passed uh, legislation in the past. Our legislation fits into the camp of contracting. And so what it says is that any corporation um, or entity that could be a not-for-profit, a for-profit that has more than 10 employees, full-time employees, and is bidding on a contract that is over $100,000, with either the state of Missouri or any political subdivision within the state, meaning could be um, counties, it could be universities, uh, anybody that's considered a political subdivision uh, cannot participate in the BDS movement. And the way that we operationalize that bill is um, that any potential contractor has to sign an affidavit when they submit their, uh, their response to try and get the contract that says that they don't participate in, in, that, in that program. And there's a number of different ways that one can participate or can't, but it's not just about a sworn statement that uh, you, know, you have to show, oh, the, this corporation actually says something in its bylaws or issue statements. It's also acts and deeds. But I um, also wanna be clear that it's really on 
um, those that believe that the company is violating that principle to, um, to essentially bring that to the attention of the office administration. And you might have to go through a court process, but it gives um, the office administration and the administration itself the ability to police this. Um, we spent a lot of time in the legislature in 2020 crafting language. There were numerous organizations that were involved in the process. Um, and we did a lot of listening to folks. And so we took out sole proprietors. We took out a lot of language that could be construed to reduce the impact um, on speech itself. Again, uh, a corporate executive can have whatever Twitter or Facebook page they want to personally. This is more about the actions of the corporation. Um, that legislation was passed overwhelmingly in 2020. It has gone into effect. Um, there have been no instances where it has been utilized at this point, but it is, it is a statement about Missouri's commitment to doing this. Um, I am happy to answer any questions there are out there, but I know we wanna to get to some questions um, and I'm happy to kind of explain more about the group of folks that worked on this, the bipartisan nature. I will tell you this was not without controversy. There were a lot of very difficult, heated conversations. And we had a lot of good friends um, throughout both the Jewish community and outside of the Jewish community that consider themselves supporters that had some real reservations about this. Um, we did our, our best, and I think um, those folks did their best as well to keep the conversation extremely civil and respectful toward each other. And I think that was a victory in the legislature in and of itself, the ability to have dialogue without being um, combative and disagreeable. So I'll, I'll stop there, Bob. I know, I know we have folks that have questions. That's great. Thank you, David. Actually, I'd like to start with a question for you, uh, sure. if I may. Um, did, did, are you, did you get the sense that um, uh, our representatives in Jefferson City uh, understood this issue and really understood what this was about? What, what was your take on that? So this was a really interesting debate on both sides of the aisle. For um, a lot of our friends on the Republican side of the aisle, they viewed this as a, we support Israel. And in some ways, it gave us an opportunity to talk about um, the community and the fact that we're not homogenous in these conversations. And there is room to have conversations about Israel as a democracy and what its actions and deeds are. And it gave us a real opportunity to educate them on it's, it's not a matter of, of supporting Israel at all costs. Um, on, for our folks on, on the, the left side, um, this was an issue of conversation about when some of these speech issues, especially corporate speech, can have a really big unintended consequence and really get in the way of both economic prosperity for folks, as well as just the general direction that needs to, to happen in order for divergent people to make peace. And so um, by the time we were done with this debate, there were um, dozens and dozens of conversations. I thought it was a good debate, keeping in mind that this issue had been around the legislature for three straight years. And so people had been given a flavor for it. We also had a number of legislators that had been to Israel and that we tried to show them a lot of things there that weren't just about, um, you know, kind of the, the storybook about Israel, but more of, of the complexity of the people. So I, I do think this was a, an area where people walked away from this, getting a much better understanding of the complexities, both in the region and around Israel, and, and where it's okay to make certain distinctions about how the state spends its money. That's great. Really good. Um, thank you for your efforts on that. Uh, so, Paulina, I have a couple questions for you that came in um, as people were registering for this program. Um, one of them is um, uh, I sort of pulled a couple of different uh, questions together here. Um, can you can you speak to the um, differences and intersection uh, between uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and the BDS movement? It, you know, is, is all uh, criticism of Israel anti-Semitism? Um, and how, how should people be thinking about this uh, as, as, they, as they put it together? Sure. So first of all, um, IEN as part of JFNA supports the um, IRA definition of anti-Semitism, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association. Um, 
which labels not criticism of Israel, but the demonization and singling out of Israel as anti-Semitic. And I think a clear example of when that line is crossed is what we saw in the aftermath of the escalation between Hamas and Israel, um, when Jewish people either um, in a pro, uh, uh, pro-Israel rally in New York or nearly eating dinner in Los Angeles were attacked um, both for their supposed support of Israel and just by being Jewish in public. Um, and so I think that's a clear line crossed between criticism of Israel, which I personally have criticisms of Israel, and I know many people within the Jewish community have, have criticisms of Israel, um, to attacking uh, the idea of Zionism in any capacity. And so I always think of the most important thing when we're engaging on these topics is to really think about what Zionism and what uh, plays into your Jewish identity personally, because I think that that word has many, many meanings and is very personal and I think has been somewhat um, lost in the argument around uh, the, the conflict. So um, is it possible for Jews to engage in anti-Semitic behavior? Uh, I would believe so. I sort of see this as um, one of the, the examples of um, given in the IRA definition of uh, anti-Semitism is the usage of um, Nazi imagery uh, related to, and relating that to Israel or um, Jewish people in general. Um, I think there are many well-meaning and certainly pro-Palestinian Jewish people who see it as part of their uh, mission and uh, personal beliefs to advocate for Palestinians, and that is something that I can completely agree with. But at the same time, I think sometimes that line can be crossed. And an example of that is Jewish Voice for Peace, um, which is one of the main Jewish run um, pro BDS anti Israel organizations that is explicitly anti Zionist um, according to their mission. So, um, interesting. So is there, are there like, is the, are there tips in sort of assessing what we see on social media or in conversations with people to be able to parse whether they're engaging in uh, BDS activities or uh, anti-Semitic activities versus other forms of political speech, which are, you know, uh, I, I think more, uh, more generally acceptable. Um, what's your what's your take on that? Sure. I mean, I always advise to not have these conversations over social media. Um, I think if there's there's one thing we saw um, in the aftermath of the escalation, um, social media becomes a very divisive and very emotionally fraught space to have these um, crucial conversations. And so I think if you if you see someone posting something that you think might be questionable, taking a step back, taking a breath and reaching out directly to have a one-on-one -on -one personal conversation with that person to explain your position and to also, just as importantly, hear where they're coming from. Because I think that's really how you effectively have a dialogue. Um, one thing about IAN is that we uh, really look towards facilitating dialogue rather just to then getting into a debate, which I think it, social media uh, also is very, um, very much the latter of that, uh, very debate heavy. Um, and we look at, it, look at it as a stepping stone to building a real um, conversation. That's great. I wanna give you a chance to catch your breath, Paulina. So I'm gonna flip back to David for a second. Appreciate um, it. David, one of the questions that came in today was, um, uh, what has happened in the various states that have adopted um, uh, anti-BDS legislation in the wake of the Ben and Jerry's decision. 
Um, are any states enforcing their anti-BDS laws against Ben and Jerry's or its parent company Unilever? Um, what, what do you know about sort of how that's playing out right now? Well, I can't, I can't speak specifically to what's happening with the Ben and Jerry's um, action and, and what states are doing. What I can tell you is uh, Governor Parson made a, made a statement um, about 10 days ago where he talked about looking at the BDS law to see was there any kind of recourse for the state. Um, uh, Missouri enforces the BDS bill from the standpoint of making sure we have um, the, the right affidavits on file. Um, whether or not Unilever becomes responsible, that's a, that's a legal question that um, some smart person will hire you, Bob, and, and some of your colleagues to figure out whether that parent corporation becomes responsible for the entity or not. Um, and and that's, a, that's probably a question that will have to be resolved in a court, ultimately. Um, but right now, we have seen no repercussions in terms of the BDS laws. Um, but that's not to say that this isn't young and we won't see something. But at this point, I, I don't. We, we've had conversations with the governor's office. Um, I think many administrations are going to spend a little bit of time voicing their support for Israel and um, voicing their opposition to these to some of these movements in terms of, you know, the, the negative repercussions. And the one thing that I failed to mention that I thought was really captivating, including folks that were even um, voting against our bill, was the idea that the state of Missouri has a significant economic interest in working bilaterally with the state of Israel. We have a tremendous amount of relationships with them um, that are good for Missouri and are good for Israel. And by virtue of that, are good for the citizens of both communities, um, as well as those living around the area. And so um, that was something I thought was really compelling. And the idea that the state of Missouri would invest in its relationship and on one hand, and then say to organizations, well, you know, even though we spent a lot of money in our, in our partnerships and they're bearing fruit, we're going to do something that works against that effort by um, allowing contractors and using state dollars for the purpose of uh, supporting BDS probably is inconsistent with our public policy, but um, I have not seen anything Paulina may have um, at the national level. That's great. Paulina, do you have a, a, any uh, info on that? Yeah, uh, just to speak broadly, I know the, the uh, conference of presidents of uh, major Jewish organizations um, sent a letter uh, asking basically the states that have um, pension fund uh, related holdings, if this is something that they should investigate, um, if they are invested in Unilever. Um, obviously every state has different policies for how it investigates these sort of issues. Um, but I think that is the main area versus the, the contracting uh, law side. Um, I have another question for you, Paulina. Um, you know, I, and this is also sort of amalgamation of a couple of questions that came in. I think that there are um, um, many, if not most, people in our community um, inspired by uh, Jewish values and principles um, who, who uh, re really believe in uh, social justice and are genuinely concerned about um, the conditions that the Palestinian people uh, live under. And um, I I'm curious if you have thoughts on sort of appropriate ways for people to express those views um, if it's not through BDS. And I'd, I'd just love to get your take on that. Sure, so um, my main uh, motivation and uh, answer to that question is to support groups that are doing peace building on the ground um, at the national and local level. Um, on the national level, uh, JFNA was part of um, a group that helped uh, increase funding to uh, coexistence groups under the Alliance for Middle East Peace umbrella, which is a group of grassroots um, organizations that bring Palestinians and Israelis to, together on a um, continuous long lasting platform. Uh, we increased funding towards AllMap uh, a couple of years ago through the Palestinian Partnership Fund um, because 
this is, we think, the most realistic way of bringing about peace on the ground is to have people together and living side by side, but also together. Um, and then on the local level, uh, one thing to do is to bring these groups to your communities. A lot of them have um, tours in America. A lot of them have speakers that come um, to talk about what they're doing, what they plan to do in the future, um, and how this work on the ground is really bringing about certain results. Obviously, um, with the recent escalation, so it's been difficult. Um, and there's a real need to re-engage each other after this period of conflict, um, both inside and outside Israel's borders. Um, so I think just really supporting those groups and um, uplifting their voices is, to me, the, the best way of uh, non-BDS uh, political action. Um, what, what, you know, I, one thing I noticed, and you, and you mentioned this in your presentation, Paulina, is that um, many in the BDS uh, movement refer to Israel as an apartheid state. And I'm curious how you would uh, suggest that people respond to that uh, particular language or, or criticism of Israel. Sure, I, I think this accusation is factually incorrect. Um, apartheid was a state sanctioned system of racial segregation and discrimination. Um, Israel is a democratic society with its issues, um, but equal rights for all citizens are enshrined in its Declaration of Independence. Um, Israel offers full political rights um, under one set of laws that extends to all citizens. And Israel does, like every liberal democracy, face real challenges in ensuring fair and equitable treatment of its minority citizens. Um, but it's a pluralistic democracy that is working, especially with some of the, the new um, government initiatives to reintegrate and re-empower segments of the minority community that might not have necessarily been given access to certain areas. So I just think it's a little bit um, lacking in nuance, which is sort of how I feel about the whole BBS movement as it kind of conflates um, uh, Arab uh, Israelis, uh, those living in Gaza, those living in West Bank, they're all sort of set as the same situation. Um. Are, is there um, in the Palestinian, um, you know, controlled areas? Uh, is there uh, uh, gender equality? Are there LGBTQ rights? Um, and are those um, uh, progressive ideals that um, you know people across the um, spectrum uh, in Western-style democracies uh, tend to support? Um, you know, are, is, it, is it reflected in the Palestinian areas as well? I mean, Palestinians, like all people, have a variety of opinions on these issues. Um, obviously, there's a huge distinction between the Hamas-run government in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Um, in Gaza, I would say those initiatives and organizations are mainly underground, um, particularly those focused on women's equality and um, the LGBT community, for sure, um, it's it's much more difficult. Um, in the West Bank, there is a, a much wider uh, variety of opinion, but of course, um, Palestinian uh, women and um, gender and sexual minorities face challenges that aren't necessarily being reflected right now um, in their governmental priorities. Okay. Um... Has, uh, do you know if Israel has been impacted by the um, BDS boycotts? Um, is it, and does Israel view BDS as a threat? So yes and no, right? Because I think financially, not particularly. Um, very, very little actual economic impact. Um, at the same time, uh, these boycotts and the overarching BDS uh, movement has done a good job of really um, negatively impacting the way uh, 
those in America, especially progressive groups, think about Israel and think about um, the, the conflict in general. Um, and there have been specific places where it has made uh, an impact. Uh, one that comes to mind immediately is SodaStream, um, which had a factory in the West Bank that due to political pressure um, ended up closing and moving um, inside of Israel proper. So um, there are uh, impacts in that way. I think cultural boycotts um, are generally pretty effective. Um, Demi Lovato, a popular singer, went to Israel pre-COVID, <laughs> the other times, um, and they came back and posted on social media about how they had an amazing time and how they were so grateful for the experience and the backlash that they got um, made them retract their posts and publish an apology um, and that they would do better in their activism. And I think messages like that send a strong message into what is acceptable behavior and what um, allows you to label yourself progressive. Interesting. Um, one question that just uh, came in uh, as well, and I think it'd be useful for people to understand, um, is uh, what Ben and Jerry's uh, did actually a BDS event, or is it some something else? Um, is, is their decision to pull out of uh, the occupied territories, uh, a boycott, is it divestment, uh, is it sanctions of any kind, or is it something else? So um, I was actually just on a webinar with Peter Beinhardt, America, uh, Americans for Peace Now, um, and Ben Cohen of Ben and & Jerry's, and um, he reiterated his support for Israel to exist as a Jewish state, um, and that they were not uh, aligned with the BDS movement. So on one hand, I respect that. And I, I, I certainly think that um, uh, he believes that. Uh, on the other hand, I think the major question is less about uh, not selling to the um, occupied Palestinian territories and more to the question of um, the licensee issue within Israel and how that situation is going to um, unfold. And so that's really what um, uh, is the, what many are, are discussing right now in terms of whether or not that constitutes um, BDS. Interesting, okay. Are there, um, are, are there ways to distinguish? Uh, I think I started to ask you that question before between sort of what is a BDS activity and, and what is not? So BDS to me is the, the how it's advertised as boycott divestments and sanctions um, for the main goals that I highlighted in the presentation. Um, for the, um, for the ending the occupation and colonization, recognizing the fundamental rights of Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel, and particularly the last point, respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties um, as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. So I think you um, can engage in BDS without necessarily um, ascribing to um, a political, uh, a certain organization, right? Although there are many BDS organizations, um, but I think uh, the the end goals uh, described have to be illustrated in some way. Gotcha. Well, this uh, this was fantastic. A really great uh, overview of uh, the circumstances here. What BDS is, um, what the anti BDS. Uh, uh, movement has been and uh, how, how we can all work with this. Um, I, I do expect that there will be uh, additional programming in our community that delves deeper into some aspects of um, uh, this issue that we touched on today uh, as our time was pretty limited. Um, and uh, for those of you who've joined us here tonight, I hope that you will keep an eye out for information about those future events. Uh, I thank both our panelists, uh, Paulina and David, for joining us tonight um, and for your, uh, your thought 
uh, thoughts and ideas that you shared with us. Um, and I thank uh, each of the host organizations, JCRC, AJC, and the Jewish Federation uh, for, for hosting us as well. And I wish you all a good evening.